Give me a little intro there, Gomer. You're listening to episode number 52 of the Station 71 podcast. My name is Mario, and this week I'm joined by my co-hosts... Beth. And Brian. So, let's take a look at some of the news topics this week, because last week we decided to skip out on that, and uh, we apparently missed a lot. (laughs) Um, So first up, we got some character dining confirmed to be coming to Artist Point at Disney's Wilderness Lodge. Have any of you guys been to Artist Point before? I have not. Me either. So I haven't, but to my understanding, this was like the uh, quiet, more intimate table service restaurant. Um, Not anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Not anymore. Um, But according to Disney, storybook dining at Artist Point will invite guests to venture into an enchanted forest-like setting inspired by Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So um, you're going to start meeting with Snow White, Dopey, Grumpy, probably the evil queen and a couple other characters from the film. So this might be cool to meet some of those harder to meet characters, but this is just so weird that they're, uh, they're changing artist point out. Yeah. I mean, with those character choices though, I feel like it can still be kind of quiet and, you know, not as, I guess, interactive or at least distracting to the meal as maybe some other characters would be. Yeah. Hopefully that's the case and it stays at least similar enough because I think having a nice quiet resort would be a restaurant would be good for that resort. Mm. One thing for sure, though, I bet this will bring a price premium. Uh I want to say that Artist Point was already a signature, um, which would mean that would be two table service credits. But let me double check on that. Have y'all done character dining in general? Yes. Not in a long time. I've never done it. Uh, we do, um... Don't you do Crystal Palace? Yeah. Oh, wow, I'm surprised you remember that, but yes, we do. Um, <laughs> and I guess you kind of can also sort of count Be Our Guest as character, because Beast used to meet around dinner time. Does he but not anymore? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure what's going on in there after they've changed everything up. I mm. guess we'll have to see this next trip, because we're supposed to be doing that again, but... I don't know. We'll see what what happens. Um, But I've done Crystal Palace and also um, the one in Norway, whichever one that is, the Oscar house or the the dining hall or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But apparently it is two table service credits and it's uh, thirty five to fifty five dollars a person. So it's still a pretty pricey meal. It's currently thirty-five to fifty-five dollars per person. Currently, yes, and it's already two table service. So I think that this is probably not going to change too much, mm-hmm. because I mean the only thing that they could really add would be the characters, and it looks like they're also changing up the menu too. Um, but I don't see it going up much more in cost, because then you start to enter like Victoria and Albert's price range, and I don't think I would pay that for a character meal. Yeah. So next on our news list is Mickey's Backyard Barbecue to close at the end of the year. Um, Mickey's Backyard Barbecue will have its final performance December 31st, 2018, as the resort moves ahead with Disney Vacation Club additions. Looks like Hoopty Doo is going to remain for now, um, and Disney hasn't made any official announcements on any additional closures or anything. Have either of you done this? I have not, but I figured Brian might be the most likely contender since it's Fort Wilderness. I actually, if I did it, it was when I was a little kid and I don't remember it. So I don't really have any (laughs) insight on it. Um, I'm imagining though that this is happening because of the construction that's going to be going on at the uh, X River Country location, considering how close they are to each other. It's what it sounded like. 
So next up, <laughs> we have the first look at Uga's Cantina coming to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Um, according to this article, it looks like they're really kind of highlighting the immersive experience. Um, sounds like you're going to be able to encounter different characters and other things throughout your visit. Um, so according to this article, it says visitors come to this notorious local watering hole to unwind, conduct shady business, and maybe even encounter a friend or a foe. So to me, this sounds like they're really kind of pushing that immersive experience and they're going to try to integrate more like interactions with different characters and stuff in there. And I, just this whole thing sounds super exciting to me. Yeah, I'm always down for a good immersive experience, even for something like Star Wars, which I'm not the biggest fan of. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all this stuff coming out about Galaxy's Edge with the whole, you know, intertwining of the land and the attractions and, you know, if you stay at the resort and everything, it seems like it's going to be very, very cool. Yeah, I really can't wait for this to come out. I'm just super excited to one see some really strong stuff coming to hollywood studios and on top of that like you said it looks like it's going to be a cool experience to really have in this park i'm wondering if like this whole thing is going to make hollywood studios more of a full day park i mean obviously it's going to have more stuff there and there's going to be two new lands by the time that this opens but do you think this immersive experience stuff is going to be enough to keep people in there all day I, I think between this and all the other stuff they're opening for Galaxy's Edge, that, yeah. you know, especially at, when it first opens and the wait times are high, I think it'll definitely be enough to make it a full day. Mm -hmm. My other question is, do you think we'll see Star Tours jump up to like a three hour wait as all those people that are just there for Galaxy's Edge come through? Mm, I hope not. <laughs> I don't think so, because I didn't see much of an increase in um, Midway Mania when Toy Story Land opened. Like it still That's had true. a relatively, well, I mean, like it still had a somewhat long wait, but it usually does. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like ridiculously long after you know, Toy Story Land opened. Yeah, I just feel like Star Tours always has that, like, it has a really low wait time. So I was mm -hmm. curious to see if you guys thought it would, like, spike up or... Yeah, I what? hope not. Although it doesn't have a huge, super huge effect on me. I went to the to Hollywood Studios for the first time in two years on my trip last weekend. Oh. Uh. So our final news story this week is that more dates are announced for Disney's After Hours event at the Magic Kingdom. Looks like dates from December 3rd all the way to March 7th have been announced. If you haven't been following along with this, the After Hours event is an event that lets you into the park at 7 and will take place um, three hours or from 7 to three hours after park closing. And it will include complimentary ice cream and uh, beverages. It's also gone up by six dollars so it's now 125 dollars plus tax for guests ages three and up with advanced purchase or 129 for day of and of course pass holders and dvc get a dis discount and theme park admission for regular hours is not included i know we've kind of talked about this one a little bit but i still don't know how i feel about this after hours event stuff i'm not bothered by the after hours event as long as it's not like, I mean, it seems like it's pretty infrequent enough that it's not going to have a huge impact on day guests. Yeah. And especially with it being, you know, as late as it is, it, I don't think it has any more effect on the like regular park guests than like the Christmas party or Halloween party would. But I do think it's interesting that the price is for like the same for th ages three up i feel like maybe they did that to discourage the like i don't know bringing super small children because a it's late in the evening and b like who wants to pay 125 dollars to bring their three-year-old that's true so i don't know i would be i would be into this if you know if i had a very limited amount of time because i feel like it would be a good use of of time with the low weights. 
I see. I have always been a big fan of the um, the way that the Halloween party is structured, where you can go in early and you're still kind of there with the overlap of the guests, and then it kind of carries out through the rest of the night. So I like that they're kind of doing that with this, where you get in at seven, you're there till park close, and then your event goes on till like three hours after that. But my only thing is, is I just really hope that Disney doesn't continue to see this as like a super profitable thing and it takes away extra magic hours. Yeah. Like that's the one thing that I, I get worried about with stuff like this. Yeah. I don't think that they'll do that because I, you know, the I still think the main point of Disney offering extra magic hours is so that guests spend the extra money at the hotels. And I think they'll always want that pool to have people staying on property. Well, so kind of similar to that, the thing that like the reason that I get a little like weary of stuff like this is because of the whole expansion to like the Disney property area not owned by Disney resorts. I don't know what you would technically call them, but a lot of the offerings that they would offer for like on property guests are being offered to stuff like, you know, the hotels that are near Disney Springs and things like that. So it's kind of like, does Disney really value the the big pros that used to keep people on property anymore hmm. or is it because it's disney it can sell as a package it's a good point yeah i don't know i don't know i'd be very interested to see how like how much people at, or like a statistic on how often people book based on like oh i can do extra magic hours or you know these are the perks for staying on property or if they're just booking like a disney resort because it's a disney resort yeah and now that you say that you know now that the parking fees being added at the resort too that kind of takes away the bonus that you were getting for not having to pay to park at you know the parks yeah it's just weird because like a lot of this stuff that was free is now becoming a premium and it's like i kind of at one point thought that that would be my tipping point of like maybe i'm gonna go to disney less but i don't know yeah i'm I'm still mad about the parking thing i don't know i don't drive there so that doesn't affect me i mean i've only you know i've only stayed on property once but i i think it's pretty ridiculous that they're literally making you pay to have your car sit in a parking spot because most people are going to be using Disney transportation. And I also wonder what what's to stop people from leaving their cars in the theme park parking lots? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people were just, even if you weren't staying at the resort, you, people were going in and parking at the resorts just to get the free transportation. So I know, like, I've heard of people that would book a reservation at, like, say ohana they get the they park at the poly because they've got a reservation there but then they'll take disney transportation over to the parks and it's like essentially free parking for them well from what i understand it's technically only supposed to be three hours if you're not staying there but i do know that the parking fee only applies per night so it's like we uh we went to the polynesian on this past trip and didn't have to pay for parking because we were not staying there we were just had like the free three hour parking yeah Mm -hmm. and also when you stay at the resort the parking fee it's not like you pull up to the security gate and you pay for parking like it's just a charge that gets added to your room so it's not like they're actually checking if you're there or not hmm interesting i did not know that again i don't drive so i (laughs) never had to worry about this yeah we got a couple uh, I guess listener feedback things that we wanted to touch on because it's nice to always respond to to our listeners when they send us emails. Um, so the first one that we got was from Gina. She sent us an email saying that she stumbled upon our podcast a few weeks ago after. Um, oh, sorry, she stumbled upon our podcast a few weeks ago and binge listened through most of them. Um, she finds herself playing along with the superlatives and. The park draft, which we've been getting a lot of compliments on lately. We need to maybe set up another one of those. <laughs> um, she finished listening to the pin trading episode and went and looked through some of her lanyards. And some of the pins that she had were around 10 years old. And she didn't really know what she had. So she found a lot of cool things. She sent us a picture, which was awesome. Um, and she... You know, stuff like that really makes my day to see people send us like their Disney collections or Disney pins and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So again, I'll say it. If you've got a collection, send it to us. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and she really does have some awesome pins on here. Like, obviously, there's tons of pins that I've never seen before, but there were definitely several here that kind of caught my eye. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Like, I wish I had that pin. <laughs> yeah, we all kind of geeked out about some of them <laughs> in our, our little group chat. I just, I looked at this again, and I just noticed that she has a Camp Rock pin, too. <laughs> I saw a High School Musical <laughs> one and got really excited. <laughs> uh, Super cool and super awesome. I'm so happy that you sent that in, Gina. So the other one that we had was from a listener, Caitlin. Um, she found our podcast, too, while feeling homesick from Disney. She said that it's the perfect mix of Disney updates, nostalgia stories, and amazing facts. It's exactly what she needed because she was feeling kind of homesick from Disney um, and doesn't have any trips planned in the future. So she was listening through our old recordings and laughed at when we mentioned that we hoped that Toy Story Land wasn't the actual name for Toy Story Land, and here we are. <laughs> it's actually called that. <laughs> um, and then I, I kind of was hoping that we could read this when Kirsten's here, but I'll read it now, and hopefully she listens back to this. Um, apparently she was evacuated walking through It's a Small World, and oh she God. said it is just as terrifying as you would expect. Oh um, my God. <laughs> She wanted to know if we've read the Kingdom Keepers books, and I think we may have mentioned that on the show. I think Kirsten read some of them. I read some of them. I have not. I, can't remember. I haven't either. Um, but it may have just been like a private thing then, because I don't know if we've actually mentioned that. <laughs> but apparently she's read them, and she really enjoys them and recommended us go through and read them. Um, and she wanted to say thank you for the episodes, and she really enjoys them. So that was really awesome. Thank you for that one, Caitlin. Super awesome to hear from people that listen to the show. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And if you guys ever want to send us anything, as always, we'll read them on the show. We'll talk about what you have to say. So now are we ready to dive into this week's history lesson of the Haunted Mansion? Ready. Yep. I think this is going to be the Brian show. I was about to say, I love that on these like super in depth ones, Brian does so much research. I mean, like me and Mario just sit back, like, I'm glad Brian did his research. I legitimately have so much fun digging into history stuff like this about Disney, and especially when it's attractions or areas of the park that I really, really love. It's just like, I just love just hitting it hard and just like, poured myself into it and this is definitely one of those cases like haunted mansion all-time favorite attraction and i think its history just has such a unique story that even people that don't necessarily like it which you're crazy if you don't but i think you can enjoy just like how wild like the story is about everything that went through for this attraction to come into being yeah for sure I'm really excited to hear what you have to say because I, I started to do a little research, but um, there's just so much here. And I, we should probably also mention that this is going to be a two-part episode. Um, there's no way that we're going to be able to go through all of it. And we are probably going to wait till Kirsten comes back to finish this out because she's got a lot of information about the present-day Haunted Mansion and the ride as it is now. So from here... From this episode till then, we're going to talk a lot about like the early history and the building, the design, and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm super fascinated to hear what Brian has to say about this because I did not do as much research as I should have. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Well, I guess I'll get it started then. Um, I get well before I get started. I will say for the like hundredth time that I've plugged this book, um, <laughs> my main inspiration, at least for starting out with. The research with this comes from probably my favorite Disney ride-specific book, uh, The Haunted Mansion, Imagineering a Disney Classic. And uh, it touches on a lot of the history of, of the attraction, but also goes into like different iterations at different parks and more of the, you know, kind of the background workings of the attraction. And it's filled with just like hundreds if not thousands of just awesome awesome pictures of some of the development of it but anyways as i said it before check it out especially if you like some of this history that i throw your way but anyways um i guess 
I'll start off mainly in the early 50s. Um, this is when Walt is pretty much getting together his, his planning for Disneyland. Um, he had always kind of wanted this haunted house type attraction to be in his upcoming park. Um, so at this time, Marvin Davis was an Imagineer and Walt tasked him with uh, the park's conceptualization, the architectural design, and master planning of basically the entire park. So he was in charge of a lot of the overall layout of what was going to come into the parks. Um, and what I think a lot of people don't know, and I didn't really even know until I started doing some of this research, is that initially um, Marvin Davis had planned for what the area that we now know is Main Street to be much more than just this one street and much more than just this kind of you know, walkway into the park. It was going to be more of an actual whole land in and of itself, much like the other lands across the park are. And um, so there were not just Main Street, there were other streets that branched off of it. Um, and one of them was actually a residential neighborhood that was going to be off of Main Street. And in this residential neighborhood, there were houses, but there was also uh, a church, a graveyard, and this haunted house um, at the end of the street. And this is the first kind of like initial concept of, you know, there being a haunted house inside of Disneyland. Um, obviously, <laughs> as we know today, these extra streets and everything didn't get put into it. Um, and we were left with mainly Main Street. But it's interesting to see that like even in this very, very, very initial concept of the park, there was, you know, a proto haunted mansion. Yeah, that's super cool. I really wish that all of this had come to fruition. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's funny, like looking at this stuff and like yeah, just thinking like what could have been like how different would the parks be if you know, you know, if we had this whole land when you first walk in. I mean, I kind of like the way it is now how. Main Street not only acts as this kind of like mini land in and of itself, but you know, it works as like a showcase element to direct you towards the castle. But yeah, it's just interesting to think. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, side note that can be edited out, obviously. Is it Marvin Davis? I thought it was Mark Davis. There is a Mark Davis. This is Marvin Davis, though. I know it's confusing. There's... That's so weird. <laughs> I, that's funny. I was like, I was like, is that right? But yeah. obviously, you did your research, and I didn't. I just wanted to clarify, just to make sure that I wasn't crazy. That, there's a major typo in this book because because it's Marvin Marvin everywhere. That, well, it's. I'm trying to see. He only has a very small section in this. It's just talking about this kind of initial concept that he was doing. But it. We will talk about Mark Davis later. So. Okay. I'm, gotcha. I'm pretty sure. He, yeah. He should. Yeah. He's definitely in here. Okay. He'll so, come up eventually. Yeah. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway. So Disneyland opens in 1955, and. Initially was not uh, as successful as Walt and a lot of the Imagineers and probably Disney as a company thought it was going to be, but it very quickly picked up steam and grew in popularity over the coming months and uh, first couple of years that it was open. And during this time, Walt quickly realized that expansions to the park are going to be a huge necessity. Um, at this time, Ken Anderson, who was originally an animator at Walt Disney Studios moved over into uh, WED, the basically Imagineering section of the Disney company, um, and got his first assignments from Walt, which were working on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and Snow White's Scary Adventure. Uh, these rides ended up being, you know, very popular and everything. And since they had this kind of darker, scarier, you know, atmosphere to them, Walt thought that it would be a really good idea to give Ken Anderson um, basically the lead in the project of working on this haunted house attraction that he wanted to have. So uh, progress continued on this um, and there was an area 
near the uh, the border of Frontierland and uh, Adventureland at the time. And this was referred to as Magnolia Park at the time. And this was more or less like a relaxation area inside the park. It had benches, it had like shade trees to sit in, and it had a few restaurants to eat at. Um, and most of the restaurants were Southern themed. So Walt thought that, you know, it would be a good idea to kind of expand on this area, continue this Southern theme and branch it out into something different. And this is where the, uh, the, the start for New Orleans Square came from. Um, so keep this date in mind. This is 1958, and this concept for New Orleans Square is starting to come out. And Disney actually starts handing out souvenir maps to the guests, which is showing this new proposed land of New Orleans Square going in, in this spot that was originally Magnolia Park. So it's 1958. And on this includes some of the things that are planned there. They have a couple new restaurants coming in, a proposed wax museum, a thieves market, and a haunted house attraction. So remember, 1958, this is the first like official thing that Disney has put out about the haunted mansion coming out. So they really kind of jumped the gun with that. You, this is the common theme throughout the history of this entire attraction <laughs> is that Disney jumped the gun so hard on this so many times. So Walt is touring the globe, essentially um, doing different PR things and is on uh, an interview with BBC in London. And he gets to talking about, you know, this new area that's being created for Disneyland um, and the topic of the Haunted Mansion comes up and they get to talking about it and Walt throws out that yes it's, this is going to be a retirement home um, for ghosts from around the world and this would he mentioned this would you know house a lot of the ghosts that were displaced during the London Blitz and everything and was really connecting it with all you know the actual goings on of the world and it just really kind of stuck in this idea of the haunted mansion or not even it wasn't even the haunted mansion at this point it was just this haunted house type ride concept was that it would be a retirement home for ghosts from around the world and everybody loved it the imagineers loved it and this concept really held through throughout the years um, as the project really progressed so ken anderson starts doing a lot of research first on the exterior of the haunted mansion and what it's going to look like and he really quickly decided that these victorian style mansions in the old south are going to be a really really great visual point for the exterior of the ride um so ken creates this rough sketch of this mansion that's uh just been you know worn away by years the landscapes all over growing and everything and it's just this ramshackle mansion and he ends up taking it to sam mckinn who is another imagineer and artist at disney and has him draw up this you know this basically full-size painting of the sketch that he had done to be able to present to walt and the rest of the imagineers at wed so they go in there with this this creepy painting and everything and it is a major hit like all the imagineers love it everyone is super excited about going this route with the ride and walt absolutely hates it he can't stand <laughs> the fact that that in his pristine park there's going to be this torn down decaying old mansion in the middle of it um so even though all of the other imagineers really pushed to go with this, you know, falling apart mansion concept, Walt wouldn't have it. And this is when he had his famous quote in which he said, we'll take care of the outside and let the ghost take care of the inside. That's so funny. Okay. That's crazy. Like, it's it's so weird to think, like, he was against that idea. Mm -hmm. Also, just based on the idea of, like, looking at the parks today, that... You know, you have Haunted Mansion and Tower of Terror and, you know, several other aspects of the park that are meant to look kind of worn. I think it's interesting that he was so against it initially. Mm hmm. So moving on, this is probably my favorite part of 
of this kind of history of not even the Haunted Mansion, but kind of an aside and just how weird this story is and how it relates. So Anderson has basically decided that they're going to go with, you know, this Victorian mansion style, very Southern plantation style exterior, but he doesn't really know what he wants to do with the inside of it yet. So he continues going around and touring different mansions across the country, and he ends up coming across the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. So this is a little aside story, but it's very interesting in my opinion. So this house... Yes, I've heard of this. It's <laughs> absolutely incredible. So this house was built by Sarah Winchester, who was uh, the wife of William Wirt Winchester, whose father owned and started the Winchester Rifle Company. So very, very famous family, very, very rich family. Um, so Sarah and William are married. They have a daughter who unfortunately died not too long after childbirth. Um, and years later, William dies of tuberculosis. So at this point, Sarah inherits just an ungodly amount of money. What in today's money, uh, accounting for inflation, would be roughly half a billion dollars along oh with a huge wow. number of stock options in the Winchester Rifle Company. So according to what I've read, this would have accounted for her making roughly $1,000 a day, um, which translates to $25,000 a day today. So an extremely wow. large amount of money was given to this woman but unfortunately same yeah so obviously though you know the case in which she got this money is very sad and she's pretty distraught she ends up traveling to boston to seek the counsel of a psychic there so she meets with this psychic and the psychic claims to channel the spirit of her now deceased husband and her husband apparently tells her she needs to move out west and begin construction on a mansion for her to live in but will also house all the spirits of anybody that was killed by the winchester rifles that their family has made why would he want her to live in a house full of ghosts that's a very good question but <laughs> that, I, that doesn't make any sense because a psychic told yep. her to. But I guess. Sarah takes it to heart and moves out to San Jose and begins construction on this absolutely massive mansion. So the only issue is, though, is Sarah is obviously uh, believes in spirits and ghosts, but is also afraid of them. So she decides that she needs to construct the house in such a way is to confuse the spirits and keep herself safe from them. So this involved her building a lot of these crazy paths through the house. The house is basically like a giant maze. You would go up staircases or through hallways that didn't lead anywhere or just looped back among themselves. You would open doors and it would just open into brick walls and there would be nothing behind it. <laughs> she lived in San Jose, constructing this house for 38 years, and from the time she moved there till the time she died, the house was constantly under construction in order to keep things moving and change it up so that she would be safe from these ghosts and spirits that were living in the house. I mean, based on everything that, like, pop culture tells us about ghosts, can't they just go through the walls? Even, yeah, or... But, I mean, this is also how far back I was like, about to say they didn't have pop culture yeah, back this then, was so. this was during like the mid to late 1800s so yeah the closest thing they had was probably like ghost stories and I guess even then maybe but still it's like I don't know yeah <laughs> I mean you can definitely see like her logic in the like in the decisions to do all of the you know m maze type of hallways and you know, doors that don't lead anywhere. I just, again, I'm just going back to like, why did she invite all these spirits to live in her house? Who knows? Cause <laughs> like, did cause they just, her dead like, husband told her to. Yeah. They're just, yeah. It's like, did they just like 
hear her talking to the psychic and they're like oh yeah you hear that guys like we're going out west <laughs> <laughs> like what here we go uh, but anyways um ken anderson loved the crazy interior design of this house and thought that it would make a really great basis for the starting point of what the haunted mansion's interior would look like so with that uh he begins developing some initial storylines and and concepts for how the overall attraction is going to work so at first the attraction was planned to be a walkthrough tour um they would have either a maid or a butler who would lead the guests through uh, a tour of the house. It was planned to start in the basement, and then you'd basically move throughout the mansion until you got out. The original storyline, and one that you can still see elements of in the attraction today, is the Captain Gore storyline. And this was the story that the house was owned by a sea captain uh, and his wife, Priscilla. And on their wedding night, uh, Priscilla opens up a chest that Captain Gore has stored in the house and realizes that Captain Gore is actually the infamous pirate Black Bart. Um, and, and upon Captain Gore finding out that his bride has discovered his true identity, he kills her and throws her in a well. So the storyline that the guests see is as they move through the the house they see basically ghostly premonitions of this this act occurring over time and as they get to the end of it they are attacked by the ghost of uh, captain gore and they narrowly escape and make it out of the house so that was the initial storyline um there were others developed over the years one of bloodmere manor which is where uh, there is basically an existing haunted house that had uh, this backstory of, of many, many residents in it dying over the years, and it was a haunted house. And the, the Disney company decides to tear the house down and move it to Disneyland and rebuild it. But unfortunately, during the construction phase, um, the ghost started at first playing pranks on the construction workers, uh, and it led up to one of the construction workers getting walled up inside the mansion and dying, and his spirit haunting the haunted mansion oh my gosh <laughs> that's crazy that it was that de- well not detailed but like gruesome i was gonna say this is so dark it is and you know like looking at the current attraction you kind of think like oh man like it, it kind of starts off with like a guy hanging himself it's kind of dark for you know a a family ride but comparing it to some of these older concepts it's like nah, it's not that bad this is it was, yeah. there were way worse concepts with this. Yeah. yeah, that's what I always think about is like the the start of this attraction always starts with someone hanging themselves. Like, how dark is that? <laughs> Which I like, am I like missing something here maybe? Because I never really like, I feel like, don't get me wrong. I think that part of the attraction is cool, but I feel like it's definitely the darkest part of the attraction and doesn't really necessarily tie into anything important so i think the thing with that is it sets the mood but you're kind of right it doesn't really like it's a little offbeat with most of the other things that are in there because while i guess the idea of having uh, adding more ghosts to the the haunted mansion is the idea but like i don't know they never outside of that are they like ever trying to actually kill you yeah i just i feel like you know not knowing what i know now if that part was not in the attraction it wouldn't make it any less like of a good attraction and i just think it's so funny because every time i ride it i like i never hear kids crying on the actual ride but when kids do cry it's always during that part (laughs) like that's the only time i've ever heard a kid cry during Haunted Mansion anyway. But I just, I think it's really interesting, like, how it starts off so dark, and then it's like, I don't know. It's not not, that bad, yeah. (laughs) Not quite as dark. I mean, think about it. It's like, what other attractions do you see, like, not skeletons, but, like, dead bodies? I think the closest thing may be 
Pirates of the Caribbean. Or even, I mean, like Tower of Terror, maybe. I, I guess we're led to assume that the family in the elevator was killed when, you know, or the, not the family, but the people that were in the elevator, you know, were killed when it got hit by the lightning and taken to the Twilight Zone. Yeah. But even yeah. then, that's that's nowhere near this. Yeah, I just think it's interesting, like, in, in movies and other attractions, it's like, like, yeah, you know that they died, but you never actually see them die. Mm. I mean, I'm sure you, you do in a few movies, but for the most part. That's very true. Like, most of the deaths in Disney movies are assumed deaths. Mm-hmm. Except for the Tarzan, man. Oh, yeah, that's... That, that one's pretty dark. <laughs> and relevant to this. <laughs> uh, anyway so some of the other concepts that came up uh, during this time of development were one where Walt Disney himself actually would welcome guests over videotape playing at, at the beginning of the attraction and either a spirit or some kind of monster would basically like come up from behind him and attack him and he would disappear uh, and then you would have to you know, be led through the attraction uh, by by a guide or a maid or butler like they had planned with the Captain Gore attraction. That's um, like so meta. I know, right? That's very meta. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already thought that the like the whole one where they're disassembling a haunted mansion and then putting it back up in the park and then during that construction, you know, the guy gets killed. Like that's kind of meta in itself too. It's like, yeah, that's true. What was the original plan for this haunted mansion that you were putting in the park? So even during this time, we see Disney trying to tie IPs into the ride, and there was an, another concept to have the Haunted Mansion themed after the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad focusing on the Legend of Sleepy Hollow portion of the movie. And, you know, it's kind of weird to think, like, knowing what the Haunted Mansion is now, you would think, oh man, that would be terrible if they had a you know an IP tie-in with it, but... I can actually see like the legend of Sleepy Hollow working pretty well in an attraction like this. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I actually don't think I saw this movie until recently. Um, but I had this urge to rewatch Pinocchio like a couple of days ago. And there was a copy of uh, this Ichabod and Mr. Toad um, in Best Buy on Blu-ray for $10. And I was like, I can't pass that up. I don't have that in my collection. So I bought that and I watched that instead. And I was pleasantly surprised. It is pretty good. But I can see how that would work. I definitely can see how that would work. So at this time, there wasn't a real concise storyline decided upon, but the team at WED decided to start moving ahead with coming up with some mock-ups of possibly some some elements of the attraction, not necessarily full scenes. Um, and at this time, Raleigh Crump and Yale Gracie joined the team as Imagineers, and Walt assigned them to come up with a number of effects for the Haunted Mansion. So they both had a shared love of magic and illusion, and they used that as inspiration for a lot of the kind of the the gags and the different show elements that they came up with. So they spent about six months coming up with all these different these different illusions and gags and everything to put into the Haunted Mansion. Um, a funny story is that they basically were given this studio to. Uh, to do all this in and that they would have it rigged up to do all these different like pop-up scares and all this kind of stuff. And that, um, they <laughs> ended up filing a complaint because the janitorial staff wouldn't come in and clean it anymore because of how spooky <laughs> it was. Well, so anyways, they thought it would be funny to play a joke and actually rig the room up for all of the, that like, basic animatronics and the scare pranks and everything to go off with when someone opened the door and they came in the next morning to a broom lying on the floor apparently the janitor had come in to clean the room and <laughs> been scared really bad dropped his broom and would not come back in to clean it oh my gosh <laughs> but anyways so through all this development they come up with this basic mock-up of all of these different 
elements that some of which made it into the ride, some of them didn't. Some of the popular ones that are in there now are the the marble bus that follow your you as you move through the library, um, as well as a number of other ones that kind of if didn't fully make it into it were at least kind of jumping off points for further development of the animatronics and the other show elements. But anyways, they have this mock-up of, the, of this ride, basically, not a full ride, but, you know, of, of the different illusions to come through, and they set it all up for Disney and the rest of, of WED to come through and look at. And they show it, and the all of the illusions go fantastically, and the whole team loves it, and it's... Like from everybody that's been interviewed, basically that was there, it was that it was really spectacular and that it was really forward thinking and it like got everybody really excited to kind of move forward with this uh, attraction. But Walt pointed out and was backed up by a lot of the other Imagineers when they realized it too, was that each of these illusions took somewhere between two to four minutes to reset. And they quickly saw that it was not going to be very efficient with moving people through this attraction. We're still planning on it being a walkthrough. And at this time they were thinking that maybe they would be able to get 40 people in a group and for it to basically have 40 people come through pause for two to four minutes, have 40 more people come in. It just wasn't going to work as an attraction that would really move people through it. So with that, Walt decided that the whole project needed to be put on hold until further notice. It's so interesting that they would, like, thinking about what the Haunted Mansion is today, they would put it on hold and that it would take all of that time. But it also kind of makes you, like, kind of appreciate the fact that they did take the time to put it on hold and make it actually, like, what it is. Mm -hmm. So after the project was put on hold in 59, it picked back up in 61. Um not only the development of the Haunted Mansion, but New Orleans Square as a, as a whole. Uh, unfortunately, though, between the initial planning phase for this and 61, the Jungle Cruise had gone through an expansion that basically took over the area that was originally set aside for the Haunted Mansion. So they had to reorder where everything was going to go, and they ended up moving it to the north side of what was going to be the new New Orleans Square area. Um, anyways, construction starts, and this is probably in the entire history of the Haunted Mansion, the smoothest two years that happened. They end up building the entire exterior of, of the mansion, uh, and it's sitting there. Um, this is when Marty Sklar joined Disney Imagineering, and during one of his very first assignments, he came up with this sign that was posted outside the front of the mansion. Um, which reads, Notice, all ghosts and restless spirits, post-lifetime leases are now available in this haunted mansion. Don't be left out in the sunshine. Enjoy active retirement in this country club atmosphere, the fashionable address for famous ghosts, ghosts trying to make a name for themselves, and ghosts afraid to live by themselves. Leases include license to scare the daylights out of guests visiting the portrait gallery, <laughs> museum of the supernatural, graveyard, and other happy haunting grounds. For reservations, send resume of past experience to Ghost Relations Department, Disneyland. Please do not apply in person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so this has become very famous for Disney fans over the years, not only because, you know, Marty Sklar ended up becoming such, you know, an integral part of Disney Imagineering, but just that this sign was so cool. It was this... You know, you got to think, this is before the internet. This is before, you know, really a widespread daytime television. So this is kind of like how advertisement had to be done in a lot of ways back then. It was just word of mouth and putting out cool stuff like this, you know, for, for guests to get excited about and have them coming back for this future mansion that was going to be built. So... The exterior is finished in 63, but unfortunately, the project hits a bit of a roadblock. Um, at this time, Disney has been asked to start working on attractions for the 64 to 65 World's Fair, and Disney decides to pour almost all of WED into only working on the World's Fair attractions. 
So during this time, they developed uh, four different attractions, um, three of which made it back into Disney parks. These were It's a Small World, uh, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, and Progress Land, which as we now know it, the Carousel of Progress. So even though the work on these rides really, you know, put a major hold on the Haunted Mansion, it really gave Wed, uh, you know, a lot of experience and really paved the way for future developments that made it into a number of other attractions. Which again, it's crazy to think about, like, the stuff that this was put on hold for. Mm -hmm. And it makes you kind of wonder, like, if they really didn't hold the... um, the production on Haunted Mansion, how would these things have turned out today? Yeah. So one of the biggest things that, you know, Disney and the Imagineering team realized was that from now on, attractions needed to basically be people eaters. They needed to be able to move a huge number of people through at a time. And this is when they really realized that this walk through probably isn't going to work in its present state, that they're going to need to do something different. Um, So while Disney has poured almost all of its efforts into doing these World's Fair attractions, um, Ken Anderson went back to Disney Animation Studio to be an animator. So with him off of the lead of the project, Disney moves Mark Davis and Claude Coates in to pick up where Anderson left off. So Mark Davis came up with a lot of the ideas that we see in the attraction. Uh, Disembodied Ghost Host was one of them. Uh, The scenes in the stretching room again were him. Um, And Claude Coates also worked on many, many things. Uh, But his main area expertise was working on kind of the the background of, of each scene in the Haunted Mansion. Um, during this time, uh, Exitentio, who was a, another animator at Disney Animation Studios, moved over to WED and started doing some Imagineering work. Uh, he came over as a script writer, but didn't have any experience writing scripts. But as usual, Walt was able to look at these people and realize that they had, you know, very creative ideas and that their expertise could be used in different areas throughout the park. Um, so two other Imagineers also joined the project, uh, Raleigh Crump and Yale Gracie. They were originally working on more attractions for the World's Fair. Um, and when they finished up their work there, they moved right into the Haunted Mansion team. So Raleigh Crump had a lot of ideas that kind of went against what the other Imagineers had proposed. Um, (laughs) He wanted to take more of a fantasy element into the Haunted Mansion. And though I haven't seen anything that directly confirms it, I can't help but think that a lot of Mystic Manor's inspiration kind of drew upon some of Raleigh's initial ideas. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. So (laughs) some of the show elements that he came up with were a burning candle man, um, a number of man-eating plants, and an enchanted chair that would talk to guests as they went through the attraction. Um, (laughs) So once he pitches this to Walt and the rest of the Imagineering team, Walt is quoted as saying, this stuff is really weird, Raleigh. What the heck are we going to do with it? And Raleigh (laughs) says, I'm not sure, Walt, but I feel that unless we put something in it that's different, the Haunted Mansion is just going to be more of the same old thing. So anyways, Walt comes back to Raleigh the next day and says, you son of a gun, that stuff drove me crazy all night. But now I know how to use it. So Walt came up with this idea that in the entrance to the Haunted Mansion, there would basically be this overspill area where guests could come in and out of and interact with some of these interesting elements that Raleigh had come up with before actually going on the attraction. They could decide to come in and just check out this uh, proposed museum of the weird uh and just see that or they could see that and then go on the attraction anyways it was more of a like free-flowing area idea um unfortunately though uh, as development progressed the idea got scrapped along with many of the others that we'll see throughout this history lesson 
that's kind of a bummer. I can't imagine that working very well, but yeah, that sounds super cool. It is, you know, it's cool to think though, you know, like I like the kind of walk through, make your own way through attractions like Tom Sawyer Island and, and then you know, the Swiss family tree house and everything. So I can, I can see where at least I would have thought that it would have been enjoyable, but also at the same time, it seems like it would have been kind of a logistical mess of people kind of pouring in there to look at this stuff and some of them going on the ride and people coming in and out at the same time. So it's kind of easy to see why it got scrapped. Yeah, I uh, I love this idea. And in fact, if anybody wants to uh, see a little bit more of it, at least in a small way, uh, the Disney Marvel comic series Seekers of the Weird is based on this idea. Hmm, cool. And it's really good. So after the World's Fair ends, <laughs> the project kind of gets put on hold again because a lot of WED's resources are going to moving the three attractions that were at the World's Fair back into Disneyland. So that took up the majority of their time. Um, however, probably the biggest obstacle that the project hit was Walt's death on December 15, 1966. So Walt not only was very active in the actual development of the project at WED, but he really served as kind of a tiebreaker or you know head decision maker between all these conflicting ideas that were proposed for the project. So with his death, it kind of put people in, you know, in sorts that they didn't know who would really get to say, this is what's going on in the attraction, this is not. Um, so at this time, Richard Irvine is the vice president of design at WED, and he decides to appoint Mark Davis and Claude Coates is basically like, the heads of the project that they will together have the final say as to what goes in and what does not. Um, they both had huge success on Pirates of the Caribbean. So Irvine thought that this will be great. They'll continue this same great work into the Haunted Mansion. So this is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, both of the Imagineers had great success with the previous attraction, but because of that, they both thought that they should be kind of the sole leads of the projects. And furthermore, they both had very conflicting ideas of the direction that the Haunted Mansion should take. So Mark Davis wanted to do a much more lighthearted attraction. And he thought that since there's already ghosts and spirits in here, they're kind of inherently creepy. We should, you know, make the attraction a little more upbeat and lighthearted for guests to enjoy. And Coates, on the other hand, said, we're calling this attraction the Haunted Mansion. Guests should find it scary. Um, so anyways, we see a lot of this split between the attraction, most notably kind of between the first half of the attraction and the second half of the attraction. Uh, the first half has a lot of inspiration from Claude Coates in creating this, you know, just this element or this kind of foreboding atmosphere throughout the attraction, which really, you know, lends itself to Coates background as a, you know, a background artist. Um, whereas the second half of the attraction after the seance room, when we actually get to meet the characters, we find that they're actually kind of more whimsical, which comes from uh, Mark Davis's idea that this should be a more upbeat attraction. I think, I do think it's really interesting how, these two completely opposing ideas somehow ended up working really well together. Right. It's really what makes the Haunted Mansion the Haunted Mansion. You know, if it was just a all out little kitty ride or if it was like a legitimate just haunted house style attraction, I don't think it would be nearly as endearing as it is now. Yeah, I wouldn't like either of mm -hmm. those. <laughs> And I think that's really what makes it a standout, like different from any other haunted house attraction you see. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's 67 and Coates and Davis are still kind of butting heads on this. Um, but one thing that almost everybody decides is that this walkthrough attraction is not going to work. So they originally thought, hey, we can 
basically you have one mansion as a facade. You walk into it and we'll have two separate identical show buildings so that we'll basically be able to move twice as many guests through it. But then even that quickly became, you know, not enough for what Disney wanted to do. Did. They wanted everything to really, you know, be moving huge numbers of people through there at a time. So they went back to Pirates and said, you know, this boat system that we use with Pirates was super successful. It was able to move a large number of people through it and actually kind of become part of the attraction. So the Imagineers thought, how can we work this in there? And Yell Gracie actually proposed an idea that they should kind of retheme the Haunted Mansion into this like southern bayou that got flooded. So now you actually take a boat through a flooded plantation house. I'm really glad they didn't end up doing yeah. that. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes sense, I guess, but it just seems like they're gra- they were grasping at straws. Let me ask you this. Had const- Did you say whether or not construction had already started or were they like still such like so early in development that it had it well yet? at this point the exterior uh, of the mansion was done it was done in 63 and now this is four years later in 67 the facade of the mansion has been sitting up there with the sign that marty scar put on it but the inside was essentially bare huh i just the the reason I ask is because I was thinking back to when I rode the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland that there's a lot more queue type of like walking area than ours mm-hmm. has. Like I think I meant I maybe mentioned this on the um episode where I talked about my trip, but the part where you're already in the Doom buggy and you're going past the portraits that change with the lightning like the black light lightning like at the disneyland one you're still walking at that point hmm. and i i found that to be real like i was like this is really weird i wonder why they like did this and now i'm thinking maybe it was because of the fact that it was supposed to be a walkthrough mm-hmm. but just a theory mm-hmm. <laughs> so imagineers are still trying to figure out how they're going to move people through here um and apparently the inspirational moment came when Imagineer Bob Gurr and John Hinch were sitting down and talking about all the development work that Wed had done at the World's Fair. And supposedly, Bob picks up a plastic apple and starts twirling it about his, the stem while he's talking uh, to John Hinch. And the idea strikes Bob that we had this people mover system that they worked on for the attraction that they made for Ford. What if we made it very similar to that, but had a system that pivoted about the center axis so that we can turn people one way or the other and basically face them at whatever show element we want them to see. And thus the Omni mover system was born. So that's so cool. It is. Yeah. Because it's, it's utilized so much mm-hmm. now. It's like it's it's a pretty big a part of, you know, Disney attractions in multiple places. And it seems like kind of a no-brainer now. But, you know, at the time, it was very progressive. Yeah, definitely. It's weird to think of a world without the Omnimover. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and this is the big separation between Pirates and, and the Haunted Mansion was that, you know, with Pirates, as you go through, you're kind of put it in the middle of the scene and you have the ability to look around at everything. Whereas, you know, the Haunted Mansion with the, the Omni Mover system like focuses your attention on more or less one element at a time. So at this time, Wed took the existing clamshell pods out of Adventures Through Inner Space, painted them black, put them on the Omni Mover system, and crescent them the Doom Buggies. Wow. I uh I want to look up this Adventures Through Inner Space thing now. (laughs) Yeah, I actually haven't looked too much into, you know, what was going on with that attraction and, you know, how they were utilizing the the clamshell pods. I'm looking at it now, and it, to me, looks like pretty much a people mover, but... 
with the little clamshell things. Mm. Yeah, it's... like it's just like a line of. I mean, I like I honestly don't really see how it's hugely different from the Omni Mover. I think the biggest thing is that it. I don't think it rotated. I think it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It looks like from all the artwork that it does just stay in the one direction. Mm-hmm. But so that's it. that's so funny. It's just like long, long history of stealing things from <laughs> other attractions and just changing them enough to <laughs> work. Yeah, and you know, we think of you know the Haunted Mansion being so original. In a lot of ways, it really is, but it really drew a lot of inspiration on previous attractions, especially Pirates. Mm-hmm. But at this point, um, the mansion finally has a clear direction to go in for seemingly the first time since development started. The issue, though, is now that they are using the new Omnimover system, the vast majority of the stuff that they came up with in the past had to either be, you know, very modified or basically just completely scrapped because it wasn't going to work as a ride through attraction anymore. So all the attractions that Raleigh Crump and Gracie worked on were done through again um, and updated to work with this. The other thing that was also going on at this time was a lot of development in audio animatronic technology is, you know, again, going back to pirates um, so a lot of the elements and gags and illusions were kind of updated to incorporate more audio animatronics into it. So at this point, um, the attraction is more or less, you know, on its way to being complete. Uh, a lot of the elements and the scenes are all set up and ready to go. Um, but we still have the issue that there's a very sharp dividing line between the stuff that Mark Davis and Claude Coates have put in there. So all of this kind of got thrust upon Exitensio to pull this together and make up a storyline for it, even though you were never really a story writer. But anyways, um, one of the first things that Atencio decided that would help pull kind of the first and second half of the ride together is a song. So he sits down and begins writing lyrics and eventually with the help of composer Buddy Baker comes up with now famous Grim Grinning Ghosts. Um, Iconic. Absolutely. And I think the coolest part of this is that, you know, everybody knows the graveyard scene where they play like the finale or the kind of like pinnacle moment of Grim Grinning Ghosts, but they use the, the actual, you know, the melody in many, many places throughout the ride to kind of help tie everything together, but they do it in different music styles so that it's not so readily apparent. You kind of get, you know, the, um, the organ arrangement when you're coming through the foyer and then you get it in a waltz form when you're in the grand hall, um, and the ghosts are dancing at the dinner party. So it's really cool to see how he used it in, you know, different ways to kind of set this, coherent musical theme throughout the ride to kind of pull the two different visual themes together. If you want to get a taste for that feeling, because I actually really didn't notice that, and it's cool that Disney does that in such a subtle way, um, but what really made me notice that more was when you listen to like the actual recording soundtrack, because it plays through all of them. Hmm. Like If you go on Spotify or YouTube or even buy like the Disney Park CDs that they have, um, you can hear it starts off with the like the organ and then it goes into kind of the waltz for a little bit and then it goes into like the jazzy graveyard scene one um so you kind of get a little taste for it but then you kind of go through and you watch the rides or you ride it and you can pick them apart and it's really fascinating that's cool i've i've never listened to it just on its own outside of the attraction yeah and it's not something that you would really think to ever do unless you're you know crazy disney obsessed like us (laughs) i feel like the worst haunted mansion fan because like as you were reading that brian i was like oh my god i was like hearing this like the organ and the waltz in my head and i was like how did i never make that connection it's pretty it's just so different it's definitely not apparently obvious unless you have a really good ear for it i'm telling you guys go as soon as we're done recording well 
whenever you get the chance to <laughs> go no, on, as like, soon as we're done <laughs> as soon as this episode's <laughs> over um go on like youtube or spotify because i know spotify definitely has it and listen to the actual like official recording it's really crazy because there's it's like a couple seconds of it um if i remember correctly it gets kind of introduced like the ride does and then it like it, it's it's a very weird version of it to hear on like the <laughs> official recorded version but it's really cool because you will you'll actually start to notice those things hmm. cool so one of the other things that Atencio tried to add to the attraction to kind of pull it all together was to have uh, a raven throughout the ride as a narrator that appeared in different scenes to kind of add some more coherency throughout the thing. So I know a lot of people today say that the raven that you see in the different scenes throughout the, uh, the ride is the narrator, but that's not the case. However, that was originally the plan, um, and he was left in there as kind of you know, a uh, homage to that. That's really cool. I, uh, I have always had this theory that the Raven is the infrared camera that catches people. It's got the glowing red eyes, you know. I think right? you might be on to something there. I, every <laughs> time, you really might be on to something. Every time I see it, I think, I'm like, is it? <laughs> Need to dig in, dig in and do some research about it. That might be the coolest thing about the Haunted Mansion, if that actually turns out to be real. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great way to work the Raven in. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Atencio also worked to incorporate the retirement home for ghosts idea that Walt introduced years and years ago, and that Marty Sklar also kind of carried through with the sign that he put out front. So you still see some of those elements in the ride today that uh, Atencio worked in there. So at this point, I told you, remember, remember the timeline, this... This attraction, along with New Orleans Square, was first announced in 1958. And at this point, the 60s are drawing to a close. And finally, finally, the Haunted Mansion is starting to wrap up. Um, finishing touches are being put on the ride. But again, this ride was initially announced over a decade ago. It's been constructed for the most part from what guests can see you know for more than five years and there's no attraction yet so disney pan fans as we know today um can be kind of impatient and with impatient comes lots of crazy rumors i don't know you know some podcasts choose to talk about these crazy rumors sometimes but <laughs> i wonder who you're talking about <laughs> yeah but um, a lot of crazy ones started to develop as to why the mansion had been put on hold this long. I mean, obviously, Disney wouldn't have announced this ride 10 years ago and then just not carried through without something tragic happening. So one of the most famous ones that people like to bring up a lot is that on an initial tour of the mansion back in the uh, earlier 60s, Disney took it, you know, team of reporters through to get a you know first look at the mansion and that the attraction was so terrifying that one of the reporters had a heart attack and died in the mansion and that disney had tried to cover it up and had to go back and basically redo the entire attraction to make it less scary for guests oh my gosh yeah yeah i've heard that one we we, we covered some pretty wacky rumors last week but that one might take the cake yeah i'm <laughs> not buying it <laughs> uh but so after 18 years of development after a number of setbacks and a number of pauses and the project getting shut down picked up again changes in leadership the haunted mansion finally opens to guests on august 9th 1969 um and the attraction was essentially an instant success. I feel like it kind of should have been because they've had all these years building up the <laughs> hype for it. Like, I couldn't imagine modern day an attraction getting officially announced by Disney and then it taking 10 years for it to open up to guests. Like, people would go absolutely stir crazy. Yeah, that's wild. 
So it's insane. Mm-hmm. So I mean, the last time we had anything similar was not even close. It was Rivers of White, and look how that turned out. <laughs> right. Oh. oh man. Yeah, that'd be pretty crazy if uh, the haunted mansion ended up opening and being as bad as Rivers of Light was. That would have been a tragedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but just to show how wildly successful the haunted mansion was, um, a week later. After opening on August 9th, on the 16th of August in 1969, it helped set the single-day attendance record at Disneyland. Um, A whopping 82,000 people came that day, and a lot of that was because of the Haunted Mansion being new and gaining popularity so quickly. Wow. You know, I was thinking about, um, like you said, how they delayed it and everything. And I like to think that Disney probably in some way tried to roll with some of the weird rumors and things that were going on because, you know, at that point, the Internet wasn't a thing, obviously. So rumors couldn't be spread like they are today. And I I just imagine that, you know, people were like, oh, yeah, someone died in there. And Disney's like, oh, yeah, they definitely did come visit our attraction. I know, right? It's like free advertising. So you said 82,000 people in a single day 82,000 people at Disneyland I was about to say I just out of curiosity was looked up the capacity of Magic Kingdom and it's estimated to be 100,000 which it is like Disneyland is literally a fraction of the size of Magic Kingdom that's insane I know smaller castle smaller park well and especially back then I mean you can kind of see that happening today, but that many people in the late 60s, that's, that's it crazy. It says Hollywood Studios has an estimated capacity of 75,000. Wow. So wow. that's even more than Hollywood Studios. Like, what? Well, I mean, to be fair, when was the last time Hollywood Studios hit capacity? Ooh. I mean, true, but... <laughs> Sick burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think we've seen stuff... Um, like Magic Kingdom has been close to capacity a couple times, at least I think. I think it's hit it on New Year's a couple of times. Yeah, during the twenty-four hour events, I know it's definitely gotten at least close. So just thinking about that now, like you know, we're in an era where this is going to sound horrible because obviously we're talking about this on a podcast, but we're in the era of like bloggers and vloggers and you know, podcasts where people have to be the first on the scene for stuff like this, and you know, like. In, in today's world, it's kind of wild, like, or not wild, it's like, it's easy to imagine a park hitting capacity for something, you know, special and, and big, like this attraction that's been hyped up for all of these years. But, you know, back then when all these news sources and stuff didn't exist, like that makes it even more unimaginable to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyways, um, I guess that basically wraps up the history of the Haunted Mansion, at least up to its opening at Disneyland. So I think next week we're going to try to really dive into the actual attraction itself and then, you know, the different iterations that we see in the other parks. Yeah, if our schedules all align perfectly, <laughs> the next week will be our, our kind of like in-depth tour of the Haunted Mansion, but not from a history standpoint. We're going to talk probably iterations, probably a little bit about some of the, the behind the scenes details and things that are in our haunted mansion. Um, I know that Kirsten's got some, some information from one of her backstage tours that she wants to share. So it's going to be an interesting episode. I'm really excited about this. Um, I kind of wanted to, if we're going to start closing this episode out, um, poll our listeners and see if this is something that they would like to see us in ro- like in our, our episode rotation if they want to hear more in-depth histories of attractions and stuff like that. Cause I know that we've gotten a couple good feedbacks on um, like some of the in-depth tours and a lot of the superlative stuff, but I always kind of want to see what everyone's feeling about these episodes. So let us know if you liked this and if there's an attraction that you specifically want to hear us research about. Did you guys have any uh, final thoughts? Haunted Mansion for life. Yep. <laughs> just, just one thing is just to think like if it ended up getting pushed through 
you know, back in the the late fifties or early sixties and kind of expedited and, and finished up at that time, like it would not be anything like it is today. And yeah. I really question if it would even still be around, especially if it was a walkthrough attraction. Like I, there's no way I see that existing in any of the parks today. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of grateful mm-hmm. that it, it did get pushed back. Like, I, the one thing about Haunted Mansion to me is like, I mean, this is my favorite attraction. I've said this multiple times on this show, and I know a lot of us have said that. Um, but it's so crazy that it's like one of the few attractions that hasn't had much of an overhaul to it or really anything done. Yeah. And it still feels fresh. It still feels new. I have to think if it was done back then, like it would probably feel as dated as some of the classic attractions. Mm-hmm. You know, it they hit that really, really sweet spot in, I think, like, technological development at Disney. Because you see it with Pirates, too. Like, Pirates still has so many of the original elements in it. But it was right at that time when, you know, Disney animatronic was really starting to get good. And it still works to this day. And I think, you know, a few years prior... And even if they had pushed for like animatronics, it wouldn't be nearly as good as it is today. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would agree, I agree with that. I really agree. Is there any final thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm, This has been very informative as a huge Haunted Mansion fan. I've enjoyed hearing a lot of things that I didn't know. It it was fun. You know, it pushed me to like do some more research outside of, you know, the stuff I'd already read and kind of, you know, I learned stuff too, just doing more research on it, which is always cool for me too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm kind of a little disappointed I, I didn't do a lot of research, but I, you know, Brian, thank you for all of this. This has been, <laughs> you know, it, it's been great. <laughs> well, like I said, it's it's fun for me too, just getting to, to learn about all this old history. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting because you never realize how much history is behind something like this, mm-hmm. especially for something that you love. So, like, getting to hear all of this and hear, like, you know, the different things that went into it and how many times it got pushed back and how many, you know, different iterations there could have been. It, it's crazy. And it's not something that you think about because it's just a theme park ride to some people. Mm-hmm. Some stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, guys, is there anything you want to talk about before we wrap this show up? Um... If anybody's going to Not So Scary anytime soon, there's a really cool uh, photo pass opportunity. Actually, there's a couple of really cool photo pass opportunities at Haunted Mansion that you should definitely check out. Just a little side tip there. Bring it back to Walt Disney World for a second. (laughs) Not So Scary is the perfect time to visit Haunted Mansion. So even though it doesn't seem like it's got a lot of like offerings for the party, please, please do it. Mm-hmm. And that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for joining us again on another episode of the Station 71 podcast. If you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find us online at facebook.com backslash Station 71 pod, Twitter at Station 71 pod, Instagram at Station 71 podcast, or you can send us a listener email to Station 71 podcast at gmail.com or call us on our brand new Google Voice line at 561-899-6441. We hope you enjoyed your ride, and we'll see you real soon. Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas.